Amina Saeed and her sister Sarah were both born to Yasser Abdul Saeed and Patricia Owens in Dallas, Texas. Amina on March 2, 1989, and Sarah on March 16, 1990. Unfortunately for the sisters, their father, Yasser, was abusive, possessive, and controlling, and basically made their lives miserable. He was a 26-year-old Egyptian immigrant when he migrated to the United States in 1983 with his five adult siblings. Once they were in Texas, they opened a convenience store, which provided a nice living for him and his family. In 1986, Yasser's brother Yassine began seeing 14-year-old Patricia, but the relationship wouldn't last. After they broke up, Yasser and her started a relationship, and with her parents' permission, they married in 1987. A year later, Amina was born, followed by Sarah in 1990. Yasser didn't own as much of the convenience store as originally thought, so he was forced to get work elsewhere and started driving a cab. For extra money, they also bred and sold dogs. Unfortunately for Patricia and the girls, Yasser hated American culture and was unhappy that his daughters took part in it. In 1998, eight-year-old Amina confided in her maternal grandmother that Yasser had sexually abused her. Horrified, she went straight to Patricia, who quickly took the girls to the hospital. Authorities were called and came to interview Amina. She said that her father had, and I quote, put his front parts in hers. She also said that he would perform digital penetration to both her and her younger sister, Sarah. However, the hospital was unable to obtain evidence because the sexual assaults had occurred months earlier, and so without solid proof, and since Yasser denied the allegations, he was not charged. At that point, CPS got involved, and Patricia fled with the girls to her mother's house. Yasser then began threatening Patricia and the girls, and was eventually arrested on charges of retaliation for attempting to intimidate witnesses in the ongoing criminal investigation. However, in a shocking turn of events, Patricia sided with Yasser once she realized he was facing jail time. She also forced the girls to recant their statements and insist they made the whole story up. At this point, Patricia's mother was shocked at her daughter's actions and swore to never forgive her. After moving back in with Yasser, Patricia's younger sister came to live with them, and just like Amina and Sarah, Yasser began sexually abusing her, causing her to quickly flee the home. Unfortunately, she was terrified of Yasser and refused to file a police report. By 2003, Yasser had started constantly filming his daughters. One recorded incident showed them lying in bed, trying to cover themselves with their blankets. This is him again behind the camera. Nicely. <laughs> 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 Take this blanket from this one in the back. The girls told police they were scared of what he might do one day. A professional had this to say about it. Do you think that those videotapes support the possibility that they were sexually abused? Definitely, the footage supports the fact that he was very abusive um, to them. Wow, well, look at this ice. I put my eye on you. I'm gonna get sick now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, turn it off, Dad. While the girls were constantly mistreated and abused, their younger brother, Islam, was treated as the golden child and never endured the abuse that Amina and Sarah did. When Amina turned 16, Yasser took her to Egypt. She assumed it was just a normal trip, but to her horror, Yasser had plans to marry her off to a 49-year-old man. Thankfully for Amina, the deal fell through after the man wouldn't pay Yasker's asking price, so they were forced to return home. From that point on, Amina feared that her father would try again at some point. Once back home, she told her mother what happened, but Patricia insisted she was lying. However, relatives of the girls said they had even heard Yasser say he had planned to marry the girls off to Muslim men of his choosing once they were of age. Amina was taking Taekwondo, and that's where she met Joseph Marino. The two were instantly in love, and even though Amina was forbidden to date, she was determined to be with Joseph no matter what. Eventually, both Amina and Sarah obtained jobs working as a cashier at a local grocery store, and both secretly had boyfriends. I'm sure you're thinking that finally, the girls had a bit of freedom, but sadly, that couldn't be further from the truth. 
Yasser would routinely sit in his car outside the grocery store for hours just watching them. She can't see us from inside, right? Uh -uh. Huh? Uh -uh. She smiled to the customers. Baba, she has to. Part of her job. She's in trouble. He would even use his camera to video them while they worked and monitored their phones and computers. This forced Amina to use devices outside the home to communicate with Joseph, his mother, her martial arts instructor, and a teacher at her school. She was secretly telling them about the abuse she and her sister were enduring at the hands of Yasser. One day, Yasser stumbled upon a letter that Amina had written to Joseph. Since Amina referred to Joseph as Jojo, Yasser demanded to know the boy's real name and where he lived. Amina then attempted to tell her father that Jojo wasn't real and was simply her imaginary boyfriend that she made up because she wasn't allowed to date. Sadly for her, he never truly believed her and his actions only worsened after this incident. Joseph and his mother then came up with a plan to help Amina escape. Joseph and Amina began saving money with hopes of running away to Vegas to get married. However, Yasser, suspecting something was up, cornered Amina in her bedroom one day and demanded, once again, to know the name of the boy she was dating. When she refused, he kicked her in the face, causing her braces to cut through her lips. Since she had no way of communicating this latest abuse to anyone verbally, she once again resorted to sending an email from an outside device to her friends. During this time, Patricia continued to maintain that Yasser was a good dad. She claimed he was never abusive to the girls and only to her. In 2007, two years after Amina's first trip to Egypt, Yasser planned another trip, but this time for both girls. While there, Amina sent a teacher back in Texas an email detailing the impending arranged marriage. She also said she feared that Yasser would murder her and her sister. It's unclear what happened this time in Egypt, but within a few days, they returned to Texas unmarried. Once back, Yasser was even more desperate to figure out who Amina was dating, so he held a gun to her head, but she once again refused to provide the information. He then gave Patricia money and told her to go get Amina her last meal. However, he was bluffing and nothing happened. With tensions in the home at an all-time high, Patricia took the girls and fled on Christmas Day, 2007. They first traveled to Kansas before ending up in Oklahoma at the home of a relative. Once Yasser realized they were gone, he filed a missing persons report. Patricia then called the police and notified them that they had actually escaped Yasser, who was extremely abusive. While there, Patricia told her family that she was adamant about never going back. Her aunt then reminded her that she had made these claims before, but Patricia insisted that this time was different because she feared Yasser was going to murder her daughters. Patricia made plans for them to remain in Tulsa and even put a deposit down on a place to live. Patricia then told the girls that she needed to return to Texas to take care of some business and would return immediately. Strangely, she insisted the girls accompany her. Amina and Sarah were terrified, but Patricia assured them they were not going to see Yasser. During the drive, Patricia told the girls she had lied and that they were actually going back to Yasser. Sarah reluctantly agreed to see her father, but Amina refused, and Patricia finally agreed to drop her off at her friend Edgar's home. After arriving in the Dallas-Fort Worth suburb of Louisville, Patricia told Amina goodbye before taking Sarah back to the house where Yasser was waiting. Over the next few hours, Patricia had phoned and messaged Amina numerous times, pleading with her to come home and talk with her father. Though she had initially refused, her mother's persistence finally convinced her to give her father another chance. Patricia would later say that Amina called her asking to come home, but that's allegedly a lie. This is a long story, and dates can be confusing, but I want y'all to remember that Patricia fled with the girls on Christmas Day, December 25th, 2007. The next part of this story takes us to New Year's Day, January 1st, 2008 only a few days after they originally fled. At 7 p.m. on New Year's Day, 2008, Yasser offered to take Amina and Sarah to dinner. Patricia asked to come along, but he said he wanted alone time with the girls to work through their issues. Once the girls were in the car, it's theorized that he tried to convince them to return to Egypt, but they refused. Authorities came to this conclusion because their passports were later found in the car. After refusing, he drove to the Omni Hotel and pulled into the taxi area. 
He also then pulled a 9mm semi-automatic pistol and shot both Amina and Sarah. Amina died instantly, but Sarah was still hanging on. After Yasser exited the vehicle, she called 911 and screamed to the dispatcher, my dad shot me. What's going on, ma'am? I'm dying, During this time, the line recorded what happened next. Yasser opened the door, and Sarah was heard pleading with her father before finally going silent. As police tried to pinpoint Sarah's location by tracking her cell phone, which was still active, a driver from another transportation service came upon the horrific scene. After peering into the abandoned cab and seeing Amina in the front passenger seat shot to death and Sarah in the back having suffered the same fate, he ran inside and asked the hotel manager to call 911. An autopsy determined that Amina had been shot twice at point-blank range, while Sarah had sustained nine gunshot wounds. The following day, on January 2, 2008, an arrest warrant was issued for Yasser. However, he was nowhere to be found and remained a fugitive for 12 long years. Sadly, when Joseph showed up at the memorial service to see Amina one last time, her brother Islam threw him out, shouting that he was the reason his sisters were dead. Guests were shocked by his temper, and once again, Patricia downplayed the situation, saying he only asked them to leave. Joseph, unable to cope with the reality of losing his first love, was admitted to a psychiatric hospital for treatment. Against the girls' relatives' wishes, Patricia had them buried in a very unkept Muslim cemetery in Crum, Texas. Since Josser was nowhere to be found, the girls' family began hanging flyers of him around Dallas. When Patricia found out, she asked the police to make them stop. Investigators, on the other hand, were busy trying to locate Yasser and determined that he most likely had help from his brother Yassine. They found a flurry of calls between them before and after the murders. Strangely, Patricia had also been in contact with Yassine after the murders. They even discovered that she had contact with Yasser at least once while he was on the run, even though she lied and said she didn't. In an effort to try and locate him, they asked Patricia to take a polygraph, but she refused. During an interview with Patricia, she was shown a photograph of Yasser holding a knife to her throat and began sobbing. In another interview, when asked about that photograph, she smiled, said it was taken as a joke, and said she was just putting it on for the camera. She was then shown another photo of her wearing a hijab while holding a gun. Once again, she cried, saying Yasser forced her to do it. When asked about it later, just like the first time, she smiled and said the photo was simply a joke. Their brother, Islam, has continued to blame the girls for their own deaths, as well as their friends and his mother, Patricia. While Yasser was on the run, he was listed on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted list. During this time, he continued to receive help from his family. Finally, on August 14, 2017, authorities got a break when a maintenance worker at an apartment complex in Bedford, Texas, recognized Yasser and reported it to the police. When they arrived, they found that the apartment was being rented by Islam. However, Islam denied that the man was his father and said it was a case of mistaken identity. So the police left, obtained a search warrant, and returned at 1 a.m., when they knocked on the door, no one answered, so the building manager let them in. The apartment was empty, but it appeared someone had fled out the sliding glass door. Three years later, a witness reported seeing Yassin and Islam visiting a house in Justin, Texas. The witness saw a third man through the front window that always remained inside. The police began surveilling the home for a week before finally obtaining a search warrant. On August 20th, 2020, detectives entered the home, found Yasser, and placed him under arrest for the murder of Amina and Sarah. Yasin and Islam were also arrested for conspiracy and harboring a fugitive. During Yasser's trial, multiple witnesses described his actions as the barbaric practice known as honor killing. At this point, Patricia, who had divorced Yasser in 2009, took the stand and finally told the truth. She said that Yasser was the devil who had abused her and the girls for years. The defense, on the other hand, claimed that Yasser was innocent and was only being prosecuted for his religious beliefs. The most damning evidence against Yasser was Sarah's 911 call. In the end, Yasser was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. 
On January 19, 2021, Islam pleaded guilty to harboring a fugitive and conspiracy to obstruct justice and was sentenced to 10 years in a federal prison. On February 2, 2021, Yassin was found guilty of harboring a fugitive and conspiracy and sentenced to 12 years in prison. As a final note, many believe that Patricia should have been held accountable as well. However, others pointed out that she was only 14 years old when she met Yasser and he spent years grooming her. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Ashley Ann Harris was born on November 2, 1983, in Fort Worth, Texas, to Tommy Ray Harris Sr. and Monica Cassidy. When she was in her 20s, she began working at the American Eagle store in the Hewlin Mall and eventually worked her way up to assistant manager. She loved working in retail because it led her to meet new people on a daily basis. Those who knew Ashley described her as a very energetic individual with a large group of friends. In 2014, 31-year-old Ashley was living at the River Ranch apartment and still working at the American Eagle. On November 28th, a call came in to the Fort Worth Fire Department about a fire at her apartment. One of Ashley's friends, Jeff, saw the smoke and ran to Ashley's apartment to check on her. He was let in by one of the maintenance workers, found her dog, and ran back out. They tried yelling for Ashley, but there was no answer, and due to the heavy smoke, they couldn't go back in. When the fire department arrived and entered the apartment, they found her body in the bedroom with her hands and feet bound. There was blood everywhere, and it appeared she had been struck in the head and neck. They also found her wallet opened on the bathroom sink. Since the door was locked when Jeff arrived, investigators believe she knew her killer and let the person in willingly. After the murder, the person took her keys and locked the door as they left. Arson investigators determined that the accelerant used to start the fire was rubbing alcohol, which isn't very flammable. Ashley's white Ford pickup truck was still parked outside, but her keys to the truck were missing. Her friends said she had been working around the clock at the American Eagle store in anticipation of the upcoming Black Friday sales event, which took place on the day of her murder. A friend who had been to her apartment the day before told investigators that Ashley typically kept her home, truck, and American Eagle store keys on the same chain, which explains why all the keys were missing. One of Ashley's neighbors, a retired California police officer, told the police that he saw a suspicious black car, two-door Infiniti G35, around 7 a.m. The neighbor spent a lot of time outside smoking cigarettes and knew most of his neighbor's vehicles. So when he saw the black Infinity parked next to Ashley's truck, it was very notable to him. Ashley's manager, Chris, had shown up at the apartment complex, overheard what the retired officer was saying, and knew immediately who was driving the car. 25-year-old Carter Cervantes, a former co-worker of Ashley's. Carter had been a manager at an American Eagle in Amarillo before she transferred to the Fort Worth store. She was transferred because she hired 19-year-old David Mallory, and the two began dating, which was against company policy. So, instead of firing her, they allowed her to transfer to the Fort Worth store. After that, David stopped showing up to work at the Amarillo store and was put on the Do Not Hire Again list. David followed Carter to Fort Worth, and they moved in together. Carter then cheated the system by changing David's social security number and was able to get him a job at the Fort Worth store. In August 2014, someone had broken into the American Eagle and stole about $18,000 from the safe. In the surveillance footage, a thin man was seen taking the money, and it was clear he knew the store. Ashley reviewed the surveillance footage and told her managers it was David Mallory. The managers determined that Carter had worked the night before and left the door propped open when she took the garbage out. David had access to Carter's keys, and Carter knew when the safe had the most cash. Carter was subsequently fired, and David stopped showing up. Investigators now had a motive for the murder. As for Ashley, the autopsy revealed that whoever had killed her was very angry. Besides being struck in the head and neck, she had also been cut in the head, stomped, and had ligature marks on her neck. The police began surveilling Carter and David on the 28th. The next day, on Saturday, November 29th, at 7.45 a.m., they followed them to the Hewlin Mall. Carter got out of the car wearing dark clothing, but David stayed in the car. 
The police followed Carter into the mall, but by the time they got to the American Eagle store, she was nowhere to be found. They did, however, find Chris, Ashley's manager. Chris had been waiting for his managers to let him into the store since the locks had been changed after Ashley's murder. So the police went back outside and confronted David, who was arrested for not having his driver's license with him. When they asked why they were at the mall, he said that Carter was there filling out new employee paperwork at a different store. The police returned to Carter and David's apartment and finally found Carter, who was no longer wearing dark clothes and had on pink scrubs instead. Carter was asked where she was the day before. She claimed she and David had Thanksgiving dinner together and watched movies. The police didn't believe her and left her alone in the interrogation room. They handed her a bottle of water and watched as she wiped down the water bottle and cap with a tissue. After she wiped it down, she didn't touch the bottle again. The police asked Carter about her trip to the mall that morning, but Carter denied she was there. The police knew she was lying because they already had the mall surveillance footage. In the footage, Carter can be seen wearing dark clothing and attempting to unlock the gate at American Eagle. Carter had stolen Ashley's keys, but wasn't expecting the locks to have been changed. She was later seen in her pink scrubs, which police believed she had been wearing under her dark clothing. The police obtained a search warrant for David and Carter's apartment. Inside, they found some receipts dated November 21st for the purchase of some very mysterious items, including two shovels, rope, gloves, a tarp, and duct tape. In Carter's car, the police found a loaded Glock, several knives, and the couple's cell phones. They also searched David's car and found the shovels, bungee cords, and a tarp. Ashley's blood was also found on the floor mat of Carter's car, and it's speculated that it came off of David's boot. The police were able to compare a star-shaped injury behind Ashley's ear and on the bridge of her nose to the Glock. The injuries were consistent with her having been pistol whipped. When they pulled the cell phone data, it had some very incriminating text messages. These geniuses were planning the murder through text messages, and David even sent Carter some coordinates. When police followed the coordinates, they found a dug grave out in the middle of nowhere. The police determined that Carter and David gave up on their plan to bury Ashley on the night they killed her, so they set the fire instead in an effort to get rid of evidence. On December 4th, David and Carter were both charged with capital murder. While Carter's defense tried to say that David was the mastermind behind the robbery and murder, a co-worker of Carter's came forward and said that she talked about her fantasies of killing people. She then took the stand in her own defense and put all the blame on David. Thankfully, the jury wasn't buying it, and on May 26, 2016, Carter was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. The police believe she planned the entire murder plot. In 2017, David Mallory was also convicted and sentenced to life without parole. Logan Nathaniel Bowman was born on February 15, 1997. At the age of five, Logan lived in Galax, Virginia with his so-called mother, Cynthia Lee Davis, and her boyfriend, Dennis Shermerhorn, who went by Danny. Logan was described as a kind child who would go up to people and tug on their sleeves just so he could smile at them. On January 7, 2003, Logan strangely vanished from his home. However, Cynthia didn't report him missing until January 26, over two weeks later. When asked why she waited so long, she couldn't provide an answer. A month after his disappearance, she was charged with child endangerment because, prior to his disappearance, Logan was found with decayed teeth, a healing fracture in his left arm, and fresh burns on his feet, legs, buttocks, and genitals. Sadly, Cynthia never took him to the hospital for any of the injuries. Her boyfriend, Danny, was questioned by police but gave conflicting statements. He was then charged as well. Teachers at Logan School are the ones who noticed the injuries in December but failed to report them until after he went missing. The only reason Cynthia reported him missing is because his father, Wayne Bowman, had shown up on January 3rd to pick his son up but was denied visitation. Their excuse was that Logan was sick, but his father, who hadn't seen Logan since Christmas Eve of 2002, was suspicious. A week later, he called the school and learned that Logan hadn't been there since December 20th. He kept calling and going by Cynthia's home, but wasn't having any luck. 
Cynthia then called and left a message on his answering machine saying he could bring Logan back home. It was clear they were trying to pin his disappearance on Wayne. At that point, he was fed up and threatened to call the police on them. That's when she finally reported him missing. Four months after Logan disappeared, in April of 2003, Cynthia and Danny were indicted on two counts each of child neglect. The first count relates to their failure to seek medical attention for Logan's burns. The second, for failure to report him missing for two weeks. In July of that year, they were both charged with murder. Cynthia said that Logan was severely scalded in the bathtub on January 7th, and she claims she wanted to take him to the hospital, but Danny told her to calm herself first. She then claimed she fell asleep, and after waking up, Logan was gone. When she asked Danny where Logan was, he allegedly said he took the child to his mother, who's a nurse. However, Danny claims it was Cynthia who left with Logan and later returned without him. He said he believes she sold the child. Due to lack of evidence, a judge dismissed Danny's murder charge in one of the child neglect charges in May of 2004. Prosecutors were hoping that Cynthia's testimony would be enough to convict him, but her stories continue to change. On the witness stand, she even said she thought Logan might still be alive. Cynthia accepted an Alfred plea and was sentenced to 15 years in prison and 15 years supervised probation. As for Danny, he was convicted of one count of child neglect and was sentenced to a year in jail. In September 2022, nearly 20 years after Logan went missing, human remains were discovered in a wooded area near Iron Ridge Road in Galax, Virginia. At the scene, investigators also discovered a gray, blue sleeping bag, a white Winnie the Pooh blanket with pink flowers, and a fragment of orange-pink cloth. In 2023, with the help of Othram, the investigators were able to determine the remains belonged to Logan. Wayne said he was thankful to finally be able to give his son a proper burial. The Carroll County Sheriff's Office says this is an ongoing investigation and they anticipate the filing of new charges. Rebecca Bleefnick was born on November 19, 1981, and went by Becky. She graduated from Quincy Notre Dame High School, where she was named valedictorian. She then graduated cum laude from Quincy University with a bachelor's degree in biological science with a minor in chemistry. She then got a job as a pharmaceutical sales rep working for Sanofi Aventis and quickly became a top performer. However, Becky always envisioned herself as a nurse, so she decided to attend nursing school. Becky graduated summa cum laude from Blessing Riemann College of Nursing and Health Sciences and received the Faculty Outstanding Senior Award. In 2023, 41-year-old Becky was a mother to three sons and worked as a nurse at Blessing Hospital in Quincy. She also worked as a traveling nurse during the pandemic and was nominated for the International DAISY Award, which honors exceptional care given by extraordinary nurses. In early 2023, Becky and her husband, Tim Bleefnick, had been separated for several years and were in the midst of a nasty divorce battle. Tim and Becky lived about a mile apart and shared visitation with their three sons. Becky had previously filed a restraining order against Tim and his father, and Tim later filed one against her. On the afternoon of February 23, 2023, her own father discovered her body on the bathroom floor of her home. She had sadly been shot numerous times. Police quickly determined that the killer had broken into Becky's home by prying open an upstairs window in one of the children's bedrooms. Investigators found crowbar marks on the window that had been pried open. There was also a partial shoe print located near the point of entry. Nothing appeared stolen and neighbors didn't see or hear anything. Numerous small shreds of plastic were found around her body. Investigators determined that they were remnants of an Aldi grocery store bag. Pieces of wood from Becky's bedroom door were also found at the crime scene, which led investigators to believe that the killer had violently kicked in the door. Investigators also found eight spent 9mm shell casings at the scene. They determined the intruder entered the home around 1.11 a.m. on February 23rd due to the 911 call that Becky tried to place, but apparently the phone was knocked out of her hand before she could finish the call. Becky's neighbors had a security camera in their driveway, which ran alongside Becky's house. 
at 1.05 a.m., their camera captured a person walking down the driveway toward the back of Becky's house. And 48 minutes later, the same person was seen again, walking in the opposite direction. The camera had also captured a similar incident about a week earlier on Valentine's Day, February 14, 2023. Officers went around Becky's entire neighborhood trying to find more surveillance video. They discovered additional footage from a house and from a bus barn that showed a person riding a bike in the direction of Becky's house right before the murder and in the opposite direction right after. Authorities began to suspect that the person seen on the bike was the same person seen in the neighbor's driveway videos because every time a person was seen in that driveway, a person was seen riding a bike down the road just before that. The only problem was they couldn't positively identify the person in the footage. Divorce documents indicate the couple had been fighting over money, the marital home, and custody of their three children. More than a year before Becky's death, she sent her sister this text. If something ever happens to me, please make sure the number one person of interest is Tim, who would do something to me. I'm putting this in writing that I'm fearful he will somehow harm me, come after me, or try to do something to me that takes me away from the kids or the kids away from me. He has already lied multiple times to paint himself as a victim and me as the perpetrator when it is the other way around. No, I have not sent this to mom or dad as I don't want them to be out of their minds with worry. As the investigation continued, authorities found a bike with no reflectors on the wheels, just like the one seen in those surveillance videos. The bike was found less than half a block from Tim's home. After finding that bike and armed with the knowledge of the contentious divorce, investigators executed a search warrant on Tim's house and car. They found stacks of Aldi bags identical to what was found around Becky's body. It appears the gun that murdered Becky was fired through multiple bags in an attempt to muffle the sound or to catch the shell casings. Even more damning was the evidence found on Tim's phone. Tim had made internet searches, including how to open my door with a crowbar, how to make a homemade pistol silencer, and how to clean gunpowder off your hands. They also discovered he had an alias Facebook account named John Smith. That account had been looking at a blue Schwinn bicycle without reflectors on the wheels, just like that bike found less than half a block from his house. In addition to all that evidence, they also found shell casings that matched the gun used to murder Becky. On March 13, 2023, just over two weeks after Becky's death, Tim was arrested and charged with her murder. Tim's arrest made national news because of his appearance on the game show Family Feud years earlier and the comments he made in response to a question by Steve Harvey. It's the biggest mistake you made at your wedding. Honey, I love you, but said I do. Oh. <laughs> Not my mistake. Not my mistake. I love my wife. In the end, Tim was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Monica June Anderson was born on March 5, 1985, in Lansing, Michigan. In 2013, 28-year-old Monica was the mother to a 9-year-old daughter and a 3-year-old son. At the time, she lived with her boyfriend, Robert Caldwell, in Traverse City, Michigan. Monica, who was a member of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa Chippewa Indians, had planned to open her own cake baking business named June Bug Sweets. She was a self-taught baker and had competed against professionals at the Festival of Cakes in Traverse City. Sadly, on November 19, 2013, her dreams were shattered. At about 10.30 p.m., her boyfriend, Robert, called 911 and said he had accidentally shot Monica while trying to take his own life. He told authorities that in a drunken state, he loaded Monica's 45 caliber pistol and held it to his forehead as he sat at the bottom of their apartment's staircase. He said he flinched when the gun fired, and instead of hitting him, the bullet traveled up the stairwell, striking and killing Monica. Robert was then charged with involuntary manslaughter, discharge of a firearm while under the influence, felony firearm, and resisting and obstructing police. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 11 to 19 years in prison. On September 7, 2003, a fisherman discovered a man's body floating face down in the Atlantic Ocean. 
approximately five miles east of the Boynton Beach Inlet near Boynton Beach, Florida. He was determined to be a white male between the ages of 65 and 75 years old. It appeared his body had been in the water for less than 24 hours and may have drifted north from either Broward or Miami-Dade County. He was also found with a maritime style tattoo on his right forearm that appeared to be an eagle with an anchor and the letters USN or USM, which were believed to mean US Navy or US Marines. He had on khaki pants, brown socks, a white polo shirt with black and brown pinstripes, and a white t-shirt underneath. With no way to identify him, he became known as Maritime John Doe and would remain unknown for the next 20 years. In 2023, Othram was sent the forensic evidence from the case, and a DNA profile was developed. Using their in-house genetic genealogy team, they were able to provide detectives with some promising leads. Investigators then got to work contacting the man's potential relatives and were able to obtain a familial DNA sample. From this, they were able to identify the John Doe as 76-year-old Donald H. Kirk, who was born on July 18, 1927. They learned that on September 15, 2003, he was reported missing to the Fort Lauderdale Police Department. They also discovered that he had traveled to Fort Lauderdale in 2003 to board a gambling cruise ship. At some point during the cruise, Donald sadly took his own life by jumping overboard.